Good morning, Rise Church. How y'all doing? We're so thankful to have y'all with us. We invite y'all to stand as we lead y'all in a new song this morning. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high. Don't fear no equal. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. to get loud. It's all right to clap and have a good time, all right? Here we go. One joyful noise. Here we go. Swing wide, are you heavens? Let the flames go up as the walls come down. All creation and everything with breath repeat the sound of the children. Clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Come on, y'all sing again. Sweet wine, are you heavens? Let the praise go up as the walls come down. Our creation, everything with breath, we feel the sound. All the children. His name is Jesus. All right. Get a little louder now. Sweet wine, all you have left. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus.
no matter what we're going through this morning, let's surrender everything to him because we believe that there is more to come. You're the God who makes the giants fall. You bring down the walls of Jericho. You're the God who gives the miracle. And we believe. You're the God who parts the oceans wide. closer to your side. You're the God who brings the dead to life, and we believe, oh, we believe. And God, how great you are, and great things you have done.
and believe it in our hearts. And God, how great you are, great things you have done for everything we've seen. Oh, there is more to come in every victory. Right now, we are going to take time to celebrate the Lord's Supper, communion together. You'll find the elements there on your seat, and we practice an open communion here at Rise, meaning you do not have to be a member. Uh, we just ask that you have a personal relationship with Jesus, and we also welcome those joining online to participate with us as we peel back the first layer, revealing and that wafer, we're reminded of our example in scripture where Jesus said to do this in remembrance of us. And when he took the bread, he said this, this is my body. He's saying this is symbolic of my body. And if we look to scripture now, we know that his body is the church universal, that the big C church is his body. He said, this is my body broken for you. His body was broken for us on the cross so that we could become the body of Christ, so that we could be, have purpose in his body to become his hands and his feet. And so as we remember this, we're remembering that he gave us purpose. We're remembering that he uh, bought and purchased our redemption to be a part of his body through his broken body. So as we take this, let's remind ourselves that we are the hands and feet of Jesus. As we peel back the second layer revealing the cup, we're reminded that he said, this, this cup, this, this is my blood. And in the ancient world, they knew the power was in the blood. You know, we're going to have a blood drive here Tuesday, and blood is important. It's important for medical reasons, and it's, it's always the, the most needed thing. But they understood that there was power, that the power of the body was in the blood. And he was saying, I'm going to give it all for you. I'm going to give all my life for you. That the power of life is in the blood. I'm going to give it all to you. We understand that we have been made right by nothing that we have done, that we have added nothing to our salvation that it was all purchased for us by the blood of Jesus, by the finished work of the cross. Let's take and remember that. Father God, we thank you for your son, body, broken for us to become your body, blood given freely for us so that we could have life. We thank you that we have been made right. We have been given purpose, that we've been given life through the finished work of the cross. And in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen, amen. Let's continue worshiping together.
God, we just take this moment to worship you. We long for you, Lord. God, we love you. We just thank you for this moment in this place. Lord, I pray right now that you would bless every person in this room, every person watching online. God, that you would move in this place. Lord, we just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you may be seated as we continue our service today. If you're new here, we want to take this moment just right now to welcome you and on behalf of our pastors and our staff, we're just so honored that you chose to be here with us today. We're going to take this moment now and move into a moment of worshiping God with our giving. And if you're new here, this moment is not for you. We want our service to be a gift to you this morning. This is a moment that's kind of for our in-house, those that call Rise home. And for those of you in here, we just want to tell you we are so honored because you guys are so generous. I wanted to tell you a little bit about one of, the, one of the organizations that we give to, that you give to every single month. It's called Teen Challenge. And what Teen Challenge does is they take, they take teenagers and adults that have gone through addiction and they bring them through that. They bring them through addiction, but most importantly, they introduce them to Jesus. And because of your generosity, you're making a difference, not just here in San Antonio, but all over the world. So we just want to thank you for that. If you want to give this morning, the, there are uh, three ways to give on the screen behind me or you, on your way out. You can drop them in the box on the way out. But let's pray and continue our service. Father God, I thank you so much for the generous spirit of these people. Lord, I pray right now over the offerings that are coming in today. And Lord, I just pray that you would bless the seed, the sower, the gift, and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're so excited about some of the things that are happening here at Rise. We have some fun news that's coming on. So September 12th, everybody say September 12th. We are making room. We are adding a service because we are busting at the seams. We need to make room for kids. We need to make room for parking. So we're so excited about that. So September 12th, we are adding a service at 1230. So if you call Rise Home, you serve here, this is home, we want to encourage you guys, take an option after September 12th and move to that 1230 service. Make some room for people that are coming into those other services, okay? Also, uh, yeah, go ahead. For more information uh, regarding Rise Church and the events that are coming up here, you just want to check us out at risechurchtx.com. Now lean in as Pastor Aaron kicks off our new series, Soil.
Well, welcome everybody to Rise Church. So glad that you're with us today. My name is Aaron. I'm the senior pastor on behalf of my wife, Erica, and all of our staff and pastors. We're so glad that you're with us, especially if you're here with us for the very first time. Hey, if you're a guest, whether you're in here in person or you're watching online and you are a guest, we're so glad that you're with us. I always invite our guests to come back at least three times. Everybody shout three times. And here's why, as I know, when you go to a new place, you don't always get the best experience on the first experience. So please come back and check us out. Hey, sometimes we're just off, and uh, sometimes we're on, but you just never know. So sometimes you got to give us another chance, and hopefully we can be your spiritual family. Also, if you are watching online, we have hundreds of people who do that uh, all over the world, believe it or not. But if you are local, we'd love for you to come back. Hey, COVID uh, has not kept us from meeting together. And so obviously we're being safe, and we're being uh, you know, very, very conscious about that. But you can come back to church. Come on, if you can go to Walmart, you can come to church. And so... Uh, I'm telling you, you need to be in the house of God today, and so we're inviting you to come back. Everybody say, come back. back. Yeah, we all want you here. And so, But if you are watching online, do me a favor, like, comment, share, leave a review. Just do something to get between those social media algorithms that actually helps us get the message of Jesus Christ out today. Today, we start a brand new series today uh, called Soil. Everybody shout, Soil. Come on like you mean it. Shout, Soil. Yeah, we're, we're starting a brand new series today called Soil, and it's really on the, one of the uh, most famous parables that Jesus ever told inside of all of Scripture. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 8. If not, we're going to put it up on the screens. We also do YouVersion Bible app notes, so if you have a phone, you can download the Bible app, or it's called YouVersion, and you can go to the events section, and on the events section, you can actually see my notes. You can see where I'm going. You can see the answers to the test. Come on, somebody, all you high C personality people who are, like, looking for where is this guy going, I promise you I have a point. So uh, they are in the notes. And you can do that, Luke chapter 8. Before we do that, let me give you some context about Luke. Uh, Luke was a physician. He's known. He was actually uh, contracted to go and find out and figure out, hey, what was the story of Jesus? So he went as only a physician would and writes a scientific paper, basically, on the life of Jesus Christ. There's four gospels. They call them gospels inside the, the New Testament. The Bible is broken up into two main sections, Old Testament, New Testament, kind of the last part of the Bible. The second half of the Bible is the New Testament. It starts with Matthew, Mark, Luke. That's the book we're in, in John. And Luke was just written by a physician about the life of Jesus, the most detailed account. If you ever wanted to kind of get an idea of what life of Jesus was like, go to Luke. Don't go to Mark. Mark writes the crib notes of the uh, of life of Jesus. Like he goes, if you ever go to Mark's gospel, it's funny about Mark, you'll see like it'll say, and Jesus did this, and then, like it's all and thens. Like it's almost like a nonstop action movie. So if you are action movie people, go to Mark. But if you want the details, come on, y'all. Anybody like the details? Any detail-oriented people, you're going to love Luke. And so Luke just gives you all of the ideas and all the context, and uh, he writes about the life of Jesus. And in this particular part of Jesus' life, he's in ministry, he's teaching, he's walking around, he's doing ministry. And in Luke chapter 8, he tells this incredible parable or story inside of Scripture that we're going to use really as the highlight for our series, and we're going to teach on that. So Luke chapter 8, verse 4, and it says, One day... Jesus told a story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns to hear him. Verse 5, a farmer went out to plant his seed. So he gets into this parable, okay? He starts to tell this story. He says, a farmer went out to plant his seed. And as he scattered it across his field, some fell on a footpath where it was stepped on and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among the rocks. This is the second type of soil. It began to grow. But the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Verse 7, he goes, other seed fell among the thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. This is the last one. It says, still the other seed fell on fertile soil, and this seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. Kind of the nature of the seed was to reproduce. I love this uh, particular passage of Scripture. We're going to use this kind of as the framework for the series that we're going to talk about in the next several weeks called Soil. But with that as our backdrop, let's pray. Father, we just thank you, God. We thank you that you're here, that in your word says that we're two or three are gathered in your name. You are in their midst. And so what's great is we don't have to invite you into this place. You're already here. And we thank you, God, that the Holy Spirit will take my words and the notes that I put together, God, and you're going to transform the hearts of the people. God, you're going to do something today. And I'm excited to hear what you have to speak to us personally in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Um, You know, I did not grow up in the age where uh, we had, when I was a teenager, we had all our phones all the time. You know, we, 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 I grew up where there were no, none of those things. We, I believe it or not, I am old enough to have like one of the, you know, the, the, the phones where you had a cord in your house. How many of y'all remember that? Like there was a, there was a phone and it had a little cord and it was connected to the wall. And when you wanted to make a phone call, you had to actually get up from the couch right? Or the chair that you were at, and you had to go, and you had to dial in on the phone, and then you'd call someone whenever you wanted to call them. But 
but what I've seen now is that like it's so easy for us to get information. Isn't information so easy? You can give information, you can get information. And when I was a teenager, when um, you know, one of the things I always wanted, I'm, I'm a kind of a musician by in my heart. I'm a musician. I was a worship pastor for two years. I love music. And um, some of y'all have never heard me sing. Some of y'all will never hear me sing. And um, but I love to do it, and I love music. But when I was learning the guitar when I was in college, and, and I was learning the bass and the guitar, and I was trying to become a musician, and I thought I was really artsy, and I was like, man, I'm going to be so cool, and let me just tell you, I had that dream of doing something. What I would do is I would go to the to, internet was coming out, like Google was kind of coming out at that time, and you can go and figure out the lyrics to songs. And what I realized as I was looking at the lyrics to songs that I was singing a song that I love, but I was completely singing it the wrong way. Has anybody ever figured that out? Like eventually, I figured that out. You should go to some of your favorite songs and just Google the song lyrics and go and read what they say. It's almost completely opposite of what you've been singing. And so I was, I was going through these, some of these songs, and I was just thinking about it, and so I thought I'd have fun today, okay? We like to have fun at this church, so if you're new and you don't like to have fun, you ain't going to like this church. I'm just telling you. It's just, no, it's not, you don't like to smile, you ain't going to be here for very long. But we, we're going to have some fun this morning. We're going to listen to some songs here just real quick. We're going to have some fun because I'm going to pick out some, like, really famous songs, and I'm going to tell you what I hear when I heard the song. And you've probably heard it, too, uh, but I misheard the lyrics, okay? And so I'll give you the first one. Okay, this is going to be a fun one. The first one was, uh, was Drift Away. By Dobie Gray, okay? This is a really good song. So. All right, now, so, okay, you heard it, right? Okay, so, okay, okay, so pause, so pause. All right, so listen, here's the funny thing about that song. So I heard, all right, so you probably heard, like I heard, I thought, I thought he said, give me the Beach Boys and free my soul. I thought he said, that's what I thought he said. And so I was singing, literally, y'all. Like, I'd be in the car, and the song would come on. I'm like, give me the Beach Boys and free my soul. I'm like... And then I read the song, and I'm like, oh, it's Give Me the Beat Boys. I'm like, oh, okay. Anybody else do that besides me? Anybody else? Okay, we got one or two people telling the truth. All right, number two. Um, we, there was a song called, um, some of y'all have never heard this song before, but it's, it's a really good song. Um, it's not very famous, but it's called We Will Rock You by the Queen. And so, and so the, the part of Queen on We Will Rock You is really funny because uh, it says in a part of the song, it says, kicking your, your can all over the place. I never said that. You want to know what I said? I said kicking your, your, your cat all over the place because I hate cats. And so when he said that, I'm like, he's saying kick cats. So now I want you to listen to it. All right, we're going to play. Go, go ahead. Go ahead and play the song. I want you to hear it. I'm just telling you, you got to hear this, right? Y'all, listen. Yeah. Anybody ready to go play a bit, bit like a football game? Right. On my head. Come on, here it is. All right, I'm telling you, you heard that. Did anybody else hear that other than me? Anybody else? Okay, good. We're good. We're having fun. All right, we're going to keep going. Um, oh, this is a good one. There's a song called I'm a Believer by the Monkees. It's so good, okay? And so when I was having a bad day, I was dating a girl one time. She dumped me. And so here's what happened. I started singing this song because I thought this is what she had said. I thought this is what the song had said because the song, the most famous part, and then I saw her face, right? And then, and then what I thought he said, what I thought he said was, and now I'm going to leave her. That's what I thought he said. <laughs> but it doesn't say that. It says... And now I'm a believer. I didn't, oh, oh, okay. So now I want you to, I'm going to play it for you. I want you to hear it. Okay, now go ahead and play it. Press that, go ahead and beep. Then I saw her face. Come on. Now I'm going to leave her. Yeah, exactly. That's how it was. I don't care what y'all heard. That's what the song says, okay? All right, I got one more. I would say one more. When you're like, this has nothing to do with God. Like, yes, it does. It's a smile and fun. Jesus was fun. All right, so, um. This is the, okay, this is the best one. I think this is the best one. Okay, now I, I, I would sing this song, and I, was, I always wondered why he said that, but I just sang it because I thought this is what he had said. And so it's, um, it's a song called uh, Tiny Dancer by Elton John. And so, so what I used to think he said was, um, he, he's a part of the song where he goes, uh, you, you know, hold me closer, Tony Danza. I thought he said Tony Danza. <laughs> And I'm like, who's Tony Danza? So I looked up Tony Danza, and I'm like, I don't understand why. This is weird. And so he, okay, so we're going to play it. So I just want you to hear it, all right? So I just want you to hear it. So, oh, my God, Tony Danza, right? Come on. Y'all heard it too, all right? So, okay. All right, look, here's the point of all of that, okay? So it's like, this is ridiculous. Okay, look, here's the point of all this song, okay? So the idea that you can mishear a word that's being said is very easy, right? And Jesus did some fun, something funny when he was on the earth. He would teach in a way that was, could be misunderstood. 
Like he would teach in a way that would be really, really misinterpreted all the times. And he taught in like a funny way. It's called like teaching through, through, through parables and through stories. And what was funny was is he would tell you stories a lot and then he wouldn't explain them. He would just do it like the ultimate drop the mic moment. He would just tell a story, like a metaphor, big giant metaphor. And then he'd be like, all right, we'll see you all later. Peace. And he'd be, he'd be out. And people would be like... What, what does that mean? And he would tell stories, and, and we would just kind of get confused. And we we're like, man, this is kind of this is hard to hard to. Some teaching was hard to take, and and it was really misunderstood and mis, really misinterpreted. And so I, I always find it funny when um when when people talk about Jesus because you know he was a master at, at teaching, but he was really a master storyteller. And so um one of the reasons he did that, I want to give you three reasons why Jesus taught uh, parables because this is important. Because Jesus, if you look at the life of Jesus, he taught in parables. We need to know why. One of the ways he one of the reasons he taught in parables was he wanted to like reveal truth um, to, to create um, more interest in discussion. Now, you and I don't understand this because we're from like the Western thinking and American culture. And what we value is we don't we don't even value debate really anymore. We don't value discussion. We don't value talking. We value being right. And because you and I don't value discussion and don't value communication and debate, like there was a time when you could be friends with someone who didn't think or talk or vote or look or act like you. Like I know it's crazy to think because you're like, what? You can't be friends with somebody who don't act like you. Are you crazy? And Jesus would teach things to create discussion. You need to know this because just I've been studying the Bible for like 20 years. Um, You need to just just know this. Just just, if you, you can go look, I hope you do and research it. But one of the most Jewish things in the world you can do is actually have a discussion and not land on a solution. In fact, you know, they always say, like, Jesus was, like, when he was a teenager, he's 12 years old, he's in the temple, and he's teaching. You know how he proved, how you proved, by the way, Jesus, Jesus was, a, was a, uh, an actual, uh, he, was, he was a teacher of the law. So he was, he was a teacher of the Torah. He became a rabbi. He went to rabbi, yeah, I can prove it to you, in the years that you, he lived. But one of the ways you got through certain levels of rabbinical school was you got to, uh, your, you know what your tests were? Your tests were how you can ask questions and keep the discussion going, not get to a solution, not get to a conclusion. That's what the Bible said, because they said he w- they were astounded by his what? By his answers? No. The Bible says he was a, they were astounded by his questions. So he, he, he taught in a way, and it was very Jewish, to create moments of debate and tension. Um, I was having a moment yesterday with my sons. It was it was really funny. Um, there was a, uh, I w- so I went to college in the Bay Area, and um, I went to university, and, and we would, I would go to these, like, philosophy and psychology classes, and they would always have these kind of, um, these funny questions that you would have, and you would just debate them in class, right? And then the professor wouldn't interject his own opinion. He would let the class kind of let them, let them learn how to have a con- conversation and a discussion. And one of the classic questions, you guys have always, you've all heard this, right? And it's, like, classic. Of, of, like, of like asking a question that doesn't necessarily have an answer, or you can land on two different conclusions. And this is the question, if a tree lands in the forest, come on, and no one's around to hear it, doesn't make a sound. How many of y'all have ever heard that question before, right? And so you can land on different sides of the question, and you're like, I got this, and I got... The whole point was not to find the answer. What was the whole point? The whole point was to have a discussion. And so what Jesus would do, he would teach a parable so that you and I, the reason he would leave and not answer it sometimes is he would want you to have a conversation with your fellow person and actually be okay with the fact that you might not see the same, you might not come to the same conclusion. That's one of the reasons why he taught a parable. And the second one was this, was to make known new truths. One of the greatest ways you and I can learn a new truth is really through a story. Come on, what is modern day movies right now? Come on, what they're really doing is they're telling you truths. They're teaching. There's all an arc. If you back, I went to. I did like a film study in my cl- college classes, you know, just like 20 years ago. And uh, but like they would show you the arc of all movies. There's an arc. It's all storytelling. It's like to teach you, like a new way, and to reveal a new piece of the puzzle. Jesus would teach through parables, parables a lot to reveal like the the nature of God, the character of God. Because a lot of people thought God was mean and evil and angry and mad. And waiting to get you. Because that's what a lot of Egyptian gods were like. 
That's what a lot of like Roman gods were like. Greek gods were all like that. They all had this picture of God, and Jesus came down and ruined all of them. And he said, actually, God's like this. He used this word phrase. It's kind of funny. The kingdom of heaven is like. He was trying to give us the nature of God. Third way is to reveal mysteries by comparison to familiar things. I, one of the things I love that Jesus would, did back in the day, and he would do it if he was in this day, is he'd use like modern day cultural references to actually influence and teach a thought. So back then, guess what everybody were? They were farmers. They were fishermen. They were all agricultural. They were all in kind of like the, the society of that. So what did he use when he taught his parables? He's teaching a parable on soil and seed. Why do you think he's teaching that? Because they were all about the soil and the seed. So he used those references to kind of reveal new truths. And I, look, he would do the same thing today. He'd be using Twitter. He'd be using Instagram. He'd be using movies. He'd be using cultural references. He'd be using politics. He'd be using everything in the world. He'd be using the world to kind of give you an idea and give you a glimpse on new truths in your life. Why? Because we can relate to them. Because we can understand them. So Jesus used a lot of different strategies and styles of teaching, which brings us to the interesting question. What is the right way to teach the, God, the, the word of God? Because I've had people come in and be like, you, you don't teach it the right way. They've told me that. Pastor, that was a good message, but you don't teach it the right way. I'm like, oh, you figured it out. Please tell me. I would love to know. And they're like, well, you have to preach like this. And it, honestly, I could tell you, like, all kinds. It doesn't matter which way it was. It was just different from my way. And in their minds, it was like, we figured it out. We figured out God. I'm like, you need to plant a church. You figured him out. So the question is, is which way is the right way? They had that same debate when Jesus is there. You had people who were teachers of the law. They'd read it right through, letter for letter. They had people who would teach only in houses. They'd teach people who would teach only in the temple. They had people who would teach only with parables. They'd have people who would teach no parables at all. So which way is the right way? Because you have the same debate today. People get mad at me because I teach in sermon series format. I have four weeks, and then I move on to a different topic. People want me to teach, I teach exegetically. So that means you want me to get up and start with John chapter 1 and read every verse through the Bible. Because they're like, well, if you do that, you're going to miss You don't miss every part of the Bible. That's actually not true. Because it'll take you 75 weeks to get through the actual book of the Bible inside of John, and you miss a whole other parts of the Bible that are really, really important. And so in those 75 weeks that you had with one person, they might have left and never heard any other part of the Bible. So I can debate you all day long on type of that. So am I right, right, or is your way right? The answer is yes. You know what the right way is? The one that works. Yeah. Because I've done that before. I pick up a book of the Bible. It's so funny because I'll do this even with our own people to be like, hey, look, like, and I'll, so I'll preach through the book of, you know, Matthew, or I'll pick a topic of the Bible, or I'll pick a subject of the person in the Bible, and be like, that's the way we need to preach all the time. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I got ADD. I can't do that. I got to switch it up. It just is what it is. And so I, I get it. There's a debate. The one, the right way is the one that works. At the end of the day, methods are going to change in all of our churches. Method, methods have changed since the beginning of time. The Word of God never changes. The Bible talks about that. So it's not, look, the truths don't change. We're talking about the methods. And so you got to be able to be okay with the fact that it might be a little different. So back to the parable, the parable. So Jesus was talking about soil. Why talk about soil? Why was he talking about dirt? Here's why. The truth of what he was trying to do, and really he, what's, the, what's one of the only parables he explains. And so he goes on to kind of talk about it. But what he was trying to tell us is really one big concept was that the condition of our heart affects how we receive God's word. I'll say it again. The condition of our heart affects how we receive God's word. So, so God's word's powerful. Can we all agree? Everybody say amen. amen. Yeah, okay. We all agree. The condition, God's word, amazing. It's a seed that can go into good soil and be, be bring forth an incredible harvest of truth. The only problem is, is that Jesus was teaching us that, listen, you can actually hinder the word of God in your life by the, the condition of the heart of which it's supposed to go into. So, so you, you, you play a part in this. I like that God is so good that he allows us to play a part in the miracle of, our, of his own work in our life. That you and I have to have a heart ready to receive God's word. And we got to be in a place to receive God's word enough for it to actually go in and take root and to actually, come on, make a difference in our life. Um, the Bible is referred to often inside scripture as a sword. I've noticed that if the sword, the sword is unique because the sword is, is powerful as long as it's being used in the right way. 
the sword is not very powerful when it's in its sheath, right? When it's in its holder. I can't do much with the sword if it's just on my hip, but when it's in the hand of a great warrior, come on, it can do what it was designed to do. And so what he's saying, Jesus is telling us, you got to care about the condition of your heart because God is amazing as long as you let him be amazing in your life. So Jesus was concerned. He was saying, God's word is amazing, and I'm trying to teach you all this, but you play a part. And he talks about the first condition, the first one. I'm going to just take the rest of the time I have today to talk about that condition, is, is the, the first condition is the, the soil I like to call the hardened heart. It's, it's the hardened heart. He talks about it. It was trampled on. It was, it was beaten down, and it was pressed And it was too hard for the seed to go in. And then he goes on to explain it in Luke chapter 8, verse 12. He actually explains this parable. I'm like, thank you, Jesus, because you didn't explain a lot of them. And so we got to guess sometimes. But he explains this one. He says in verse 12, the seeds that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message. This is good. Hey, if you're a Christian in here and you've been a Christian for a long time, he's talking to you. He's talking to me. If you ain't a Christian in here. You're in luck. I'm going to get all the Christians for you. So you're good. Don't worry. And he says, those who hear the message, but only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. Now, when we read that, all the Christians say, that ain't me because I'm saved. You're wrong. Because the word sozo there means kind of being, being saved, to be rescued, to kept being kept away from danger or destruction, to be kept safe and sound. And how many of y'all know there's a difference between justification and God coming into your life? That's a fancy theological word that when you and I say yes to God, we look up to heaven, we say, thank you, Jesus. I've now received the good gift of God. I had nothing to do with this. And now I got to have spent heaven and eternity with you. God, thank you for justifying me and making me right. Justification. But there's a difference between being justified and now moving into sanctified and actually being rescued on a daily basis and so you and I have been caught and taught that you and I just need to give our lives to God and it cheapens the gospel and right now it's really fancy and it's really popular to be like just be good with God and you all good the problem is is that the work of the Holy Spirit moves on a regular basis and if you're not constantly moving from justification God I have this faith and this gift in you but now I'm moving into sanctification every day I wake up and I try to look at the condition of my heart and is it too hard for you to come in today because if it's too hard for you to come in today then it's just going to be falling on deaf ears and you're not going to be able to come into my heart and Satan's going to come take it away and now I'm going to have the result of that so right like he's trying to give us an understanding that even Christians can have hardened hearts towards God and that scares me I don't know if it scares you but it scares me it kind of puts this like man I thought I was good and you are good because you got God only problem is, is you still here on earth. Last time I checked, when you get saved, Star Trek doesn't happen. You don't get beamed to heaven. How many of y'all wish that's happened sometime? You know what I'm saying? Like, you're like, the longer the world goes on, I'm like, I got to be honest with you, God. I'm, I'm kind of ready now. Come on. And, 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 and you look at it, and, and he, what he was saying was he's saying God's word was delivered to keep you safe to rescue you but a hardened heart right this one does their hearts are, are like as a footpath trampled so it doesn't it doesn't take root and then satan comes and takes it away and i always laugh and people give satan too much credit because like it's really not that hard for the bird to come and take the seed when it's just sitting there like they weren't very crafty they just saw it and they're like oh And so sometimes we got to like think that Satan is like really, really crafty. And he's honestly, he's, he's very good. You need to understand, like, he's been around for a long time. And he knows humans very well. But sometimes he don't need to be that crafty to get you. Isn't that funny? Like sometimes we'll be like, Satan's out to get me. I got a flat tire. No, you just ran over a nail. <laughs> I got fired from my job. Satan's after me. No, you didn't show up to work. <laughs> Come on. Like, how many of y'all know that person? They called you to say, pray for me. Satan's after me. My boss just fired me. There's no reason. And they tell you they didn't show up to work, and they never do what they're asked. And they're like, you're like, honey, you don't, you, that ain't Satan. That's you. That's you. 
And so sometimes it's not Satan being crafty. Sometimes it's just we send up, just we, we made it easy. How many of you, you ever, you just went to that place, you know you shouldn't have gone? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you don't have, like what's funny, I'd be like, you know, sometimes as preachers we want to use like illustrations or examples. But the funny thing is, is all y'all know where you shouldn't have been. You watched something you shouldn't have watched. You clicked something. And that led to you clicking another one. And before you know it, you're where? And you were like, and something happened in the result of it. You're like, Satan is a lie. Get him out of my, my life, you know. And you're like, no, you pressed the button. You made it easy. You kept your heart closed. And then the seed was just sitting there. And Satan goes, hmm. <laughs> I think that happens sometimes. Yeah. And it's tragic as a pastor for me. You know, one of the ways that I see this a lot is parents, um, like I'll watch kids grow up with their families. And they'll grow up. And I'll never see their kids, but the parents will come to church, and then they get older, and they come to me, and they're crying. My, my son doesn't love God. Satan has taken my son from God. And I said, did you, did you ever pray with them? No. Did, did you ever bring them the Bible? No. I didn't want to force it on them. Did you ever teach them about God? No. Did, did you ever bring them to church? No. Did you ever bring them to youth ministry? No. And I, 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 it breaks my heart because I say, that's not Satan. You made it easy. You, you kept their hearts hard. And so the, the, the seed that if it was ever preached to them, it just landed on rocks. It just yeah. bounced right out of their life. I was a youth pastor for 10 years. Don't tell me it don't happen. Yeah. It happens. So, 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 so if that's true, then I just wanted to, as I wrap up today, give you a few ways that I hear people say things that cause us to think and make us potentially have a hard heart. Here, how do you know? The question you have to ask yourself, because if that's true, right, it's dangerous. How do you know if you have a hard heart? How, how do you know that? Because that's what I'd ask. Well, okay, well, I go, okay, look, I believe you, Pastor. I believe you. I'm with you. But how do I know if I have a hard heart? This, this is how you know. This, this is a couple, couple, couple statements I hear. Number one is um, you'll hear the word of God, and then you say, oh, I've already heard this. <laughs> to all the Christians everywhere. I'm going to get them, y'all. It's going to be good. <laughs> I'm one of them, so it's all good. It's good. Don't worry. It's okay. You say stuff like, I've already heard. This is, this is what I call the spirit of familiarity. you too familiar. You're too close. You don't even see the gift anymore. You see the burden. You see the obligation. What was once a gift in your life, you thought you would just give up your life for, now you feel burdened by your spouse. Do you remember when you looked into her eyes and it was like, wow. When you saw him walk in, and he, he, because guys, you all and I do this. We pick up boxes when we, we flex, though. We don't pick them up like a normal person should pick up a box when we're, in, when we're trying to court a lady, right? We, we, we do like, you know what I mean? We, we, we kind of, we take off our shirt and we, <laughs> oh, this box right here, where can I, where can I put it? You know, and you're, you're flexing because you, you wanted to do every, come on. There was a gift that was in front of you and you were like, if I could just obtain that gift. And, and now you wake up and you look at that gift as a burden and an obligation. Your kids, the Bible says children are a blessing. But how many of y'all know it's pretty easy? It's pretty easy to get familiar with your kids. <laughs> when they be coming downstairs. At like 3.30 in the morning. And obviously, look, I get it. Sometimes you don't know if it's morning because it's like, hey, it's 7-ish. The light is out. You, kids can be confused that it's, hey, is it morning time yet? You know, it feels like morning, the light's out. But when it's pitch black outside, <laughs> it ain't morning. It's sleep time. It's not night. I said, it's not night time. And so they come down. Come on, how many of y'all know at that moment, it's easy to see the blessing as a burden? Or when you first got saved in a church, or you first found a church that bring you real spiritual family. And that worship was so good. And, and I had a decent message. And you were like, Pastor Aaron had a great message for me. And it's been a couple years now. I'm talking to you. And now you walk in and you wake up. Well, you used to have a, remember when you used to have the step? 
You got out of bed. I get to go to church. And then moved to, I got to go to church. And now you're like, I got to go to church. Now I'm, I got to go to church. <laughs> Anybody else there but me? And, and God will convict you, and he'll be like, I thought that was a blessing. I brought that church to bless you, and you, you see it as a burden. You know why you do that? You know why I do that? We're too familiar with it. Too close. You got too close. You, 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 you know, we, here's what it is. You normalize what's really not normal. That's what they did with Jesus in his hometown in Nazareth. It's the Son of Man's walking. If you don't, go show read it. The Son of Man, God on earth, walking around, doing miracles. And the Bible says he could do very little miracles there. Why? 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 Because they thought of him as just normal. This is the carpenter's kid. We know Jesus. I played soccer with him. He ain't that cool. I've seen him a bunch. It's the spirit of familiarity. Be careful you don't do that with each other. You don't do that with your church, your staff, your, po- your, your, your bosses. Come on, your people, your family. It'll, it'll creep in. Second one is this, is Harden's heart. Uh, this is the other one I hear. This doesn't apply to me or my situation. Or you have no idea what you're talking about. Now, this is the spirit of pride, okay? Here's why, this, is, this whole reason is the whole reason why I, don't not, I do not do counseling at our church. You can smile, it's okay. <laughs> but he doesn't do counseling? No. Our executive pastor can, and then we can get you to some great counselors. But here's why. 99.9% of the people who come in our church and want counseling with me will sit down in front of me in our office, and I'll say, how can I help you? And they'll tell me their situation, and you know what I'll do? <laughs> I know it's groundbreaking. I'll take this out. And I'll say, and they'll ask me, what do you think? I said, I don't know. Let's see what God thinks. And they're like, no, 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 I've already read that. That doesn't apply to me in my situation. And I'm like, and I was laughing. I'm like, well, I'm a Bible teacher. <laughs> so if, you, I mean, I, I guess you could Google it, but you don't need me for that. So I can help you with the, what the Bible says. I know, Pastor, but, but that doesn't apply to me. And my situation and what I'm going through. And I look at them kind of funny because I kind of go, so what you're saying is you figured you found something that God has never seen before. This is amazing. What you're saying to me is that the God of the universe who sees all, knows all, all doesn't know how to handle your situation. And they're like, well, that's not what I'm saying. But it's not working. And I said, but, but it sounds like, come on, it sounds like your heart has been hardened to the things of God. And you think that there's something special out there that God has not gone through. I like what the Bible says about Jesus, that he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. That, okay, maybe a smartphone didn't exist during Jesus' time, but lust did. Gossip did. So, so you see what I'm saying? You can get fancy with the particulars, but at the end of the day, it's all the same root. It's all hardened apart. Last one is this. Is, this is, I hear it a lot. That's the spirit of pride. This is the third one. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's really the spirit of ignorance. Is that you have now chosen not to know anything about what God has to say about your situation. And now, so when the Bible speaks to you or when God's word is spoken over you, um, you, you have drifted to the point where you forgot what it said. You become ignorant. And you didn't do it like this. You didn't say, I don't believe. You didn't wake up one day saying, I don't believe. What you did is you woke up and what you used to do in the morning is you used to read your Bible and you used to pray. You used to pray over your wife, your kids. You used to pray over your husband, your kids. You used to do what you're, you, you come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. You used to have rhythms. You used to walk. And then one day you just said, I can't read my Bible today. I'm too busy. And then you only prayed and then you only, you know, spoke a life over your kids and you had some daily affirmations. And then you're like, man, I'm too busy. I can't read my Bible and I can't pray today. But I'm just going to speak daily affirmations and I'm just going to speak daily as I'm walking out the door. And then before you know it, now you don't do any of those things. Uh, come on. And now instead of picking up your Bible, you pick up your phone and you go to Twitter and you go to Instagram and you start polluting your soul and you start making your heart what was once nice and fertile soil. 
And you just keep pressing on it and pressing on it with the garbage of this world, which is social media and all of its terribleness. And you think that when you come into church, remember when you used to come into church and you hear God's word and you're like, that's good. And now you walk into church and you're like, that ain't good. <laughs> Nobody cares. Life is terrible. Did you see where they're at today? I wish I was on vacation. <laughs> Why don't I ever get any breaks in life? Come on, right? That stuff doesn't happen over time. I was watching the Olympics because that's what you do right now. You watch the Olympics. And I was watching these guys. It's pretty amazing. Like the archery. Anybody watch the archery? Other than me? Am I the only person? Okay, I got two. All right, great. I was watching the archery or even the shooting. They have like these, uh, there's like air, air rifles. You know, they're shooting these air rifles. I'm like, it's amazing. And the commentator was saying they have to be so precise because the distance is so long that if they're off by just a millimeter, by the time it gets to the target, they're way off. And what's funny about our life is that you and I are in a long distance race. We really are. We're in a long, we're shooting for long term here. And if you're off by just a little bit, come on, right? By just a little, by the time you get to the end, you realize, has anybody ever said that before? You, you, you thought you get, to, you get to some place a long way and you're like, how did I get here? It's because you made a little course correction that was actually negative. I was the other day. Can I make a confession to you? Confessions of a pastor. Um, I was sitting on my couch, and my wife, we were, um, I think we were watching the Olympics or something. And my kids came down. Um, they were getting ready for, for bed, and, and uh, they gave a hug and, and a kiss. And said, nah, nah. Don't get, and uh, they walk upstairs. My wife turns to me, she goes, how come you don't read to them anymore? You used to read to them, like, all the time. And they're like, well, what'd you read to them? You know, like, sometimes I read them Bible stories. Sometimes I just read them a fun story. You know what I mean? You're like, I, I was just, whatever it was. And I said, I, I don't know. And I looked at her, I, I didn't have an answer. And I remembered that there was one day where I was like, man, I'm too tired. I'm not going to do it today. And then I, I, then I did it the next several days. And then I... One day turned into two days. Come on, y'all. Two days turned into eight days. Eight days turned into forever. And I realized that that one little decision kind of just tweaks. Just, and before you know it, I was, come on. I, I don't know. How did I, how did I get here? So I'm done. I'm closing. If those, are your, 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 if those statements ever creeped out of your mouth and you feel like your heart is, hard, your heart is hardened, then... then Two ways, just real quick anecdotes as I close. Just maybe some things to think about. That when you hear the word of God and you feel like it's just not going in anymore, and maybe you relate to some of those, like I do. You relate to some of those sometimes. And maybe it's not all the time, but you know, maybe it's sometimes, right? One of the ways you can kind of start tilling up the ground a little bit. Um, when the word of God is spoken over your life or spoken to you, get creative. Um, when you come in here, try sitting in a different seat in the church. I'm just, I'm being, I'm just getting practical with you. Can I do that for a minute? It sounds silly. Change it up. Right, no, I'm a creature of habit. Okay, great. Change it up. Take notes. If you don't take notes, start taking. I'm telling you, you're going to have to get creative to till that ground up. If you take notes right now, take notes in a different way. I take them on my phone, start writing them out. If you write them out, take them on your phone. Come on. If, if uh, maybe you're going to need to figure out a way to, 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 to receive the word of God differently. Maybe instead of, hey, after church on Sunday, you go, we do, by the way, we do podcasts like on every basic digital platform out there. We are on Apple Podcasts. We are on Google Podcasts. We are on YouTube. We are on Spotify. Like we're on every, we're everywhere. So you can find us everywhere. Maybe while you're way to work, re-watch, re-watch, re-watch the message, re-listen to the message. Come on, I'm talking about getting creative. Try different ways to get it into your heart when you do that, you'll be surprised. It'll start to till up some of that ground that's been trampled on and all the ways that you thought I heard this before. And I'm not going to come. I'm telling you, you have to do something different. And the second way, and I think this is really, really important. I promise you I'm done. This is it. Um, to actively engage the word of God. Now, I think you can do this two ways. Okay. So just go with me for a minute. I think you do this two ways. First way is I think you can respond to the word. Okay. You can respond to the word. Everybody say respond. Okay. Now listen, I know this sounds odd and it sounds unique, but responding to the word of God being preached is very biblical. The word amen 
in, in and of itself has roots Hebraically in the idea that you were agreeing with what was being said to you. And there is a power in the spoken word over your life. There's also a power of you agreeing with the spoken word over your life. And so, look, I'm not saying we got to get hyper charismatic and Pentecostal in our church. But I am saying that there is a difference between just sitting there. Okay. And then walking out and being actively engaged. Now, we're going to have a fun here for just a minute. Okay. So y'all, are y'all in these nice comfy seats? I didn't grow up in those comfy seats. I grew up in church where there were pews and they were trying to torture you while you were listening to the word of God. So, like, thank God for, how many of y'all just love cushion? All right, y'all, y'all, I just love, thank you for the cushions on the seats. So here's what I want you to do. Maybe instead of just sitting there, you lean forward and you get a little more engaged in the word. Just try it. Everybody just lean forward. Just come on. Give yourself a lean. Yo, yeah, there you lean forward. I know this feels good, but lean forward. Just, I'm going to be engaged in the word. When I say something good, when you say amen or that's good, you're not making me feel good. I don't, it, I don't, I preach good whether or not you say that at all, all right? I just affirm myself, all right? But when you say amen and you say that's good, pastor, preach, white boy, when you do whatever you want, what you're doing is you're saying amen. I believe that for me. I want to receive that. I'm getting that dirt in my heart just kind of churned up so that seed can go in my heart. I just... It's amazing to me, again, like you can go to some sports arenas and you'll be screaming for people you never met in your entire life talking about, we won. No, you didn't. They won. And you paid $99.95 for that bandana you be wearing. It's got your jersey and your, you know, the club name on it. But we can come in here and sit like we need to be quiet in church. You ain't need to be quiet in church. So I'm teaching you something. It's not just culturally Christian. It's not. Because I know I know what you're saying. You're like, but what about the weird churches that all they be doing is shouting the pastor down? I'm not telling you that. I'm just saying at some point you need to open your mouth and say, that's good. I receive it. I agree. So testing time. Y'all ready? I'm just going to make it easy. I'm going to say God is good, and you just going to say amen. Let's just try that, okay? Let's see if we can get 99% of participation, and we'll start there. Baby steps? Amen. Baby steps. All right, here we go. God is good. Amen. Oh, okay, that's good. All right, let's try one more time. God is good. Amen. That's good. All right, say, say amen like you, old school Pentecostal preacher from your belly. God is good. Amen. Yeah. I'm telling you. You start getting engaged in the word of God, that, that's, that dirt can't stay there. Come on, it gets in you. you. Before you know, you start walking around, change. All right, I'm done. Somebody's like, amen. All right, no. And I, I really believe this, though. I, I believe, I believe, when we can just be engaged in the word, come on, you respond with action. Respond with action. You got to be able to speak that over your life. That's my desire for you as a pastor. Don't come in here and just go to church. Please stop doing that. You can't do it anymore. We, look, there was a season where you could just be a fun Christian, and you didn't really have to take it seriously. These are not them times, y'all. They're not. You take this thing seriously. You got to take this thing seriously. And I believe in you. I know you can do it. I know God's speaking to you. And if your heart has become hardened over your lifetime, I pray that God would continue to churn it up so that the word can go in deep, take root. Because if Jesus was concerned about it, we should be concerned about it. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you, Lord, that there is, there is a, a newness of life when we walk into a relationship with you, that we're justified by faith through Christ, that, that we don't have to do nothing to save ourselves. You did everything. But God, that every day we wake up and make a decision to be sanctified, God, we take that step across across our world and across our pain, across our purpose, across our, our frustration, across everything that's gotten in the way, all the roadblocks, all the pain, all the anger, all the hurt. We get past all that and we move into our purpose. We move into, God, we move into our purpose with you. And today we give you all the praise and all the glory. And we know that today, God, you, you, God, can keep our hearts from being hardened. 
in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, maybe you're in here and you've never given your life to Jesus. I want to give you that opportunity right now. Maybe you've wanted to. Maybe you've hoped to. Maybe you've wanted to take that step, but you've never done it. Today can be your day. We don't make you stand up or talk to anybody you don't know. We just have you lift your hands in just a moment so that we can know you did that, so we can pray with you. Maybe you're a second person in here and you're like, man, I gave my life to God a long time ago, but honestly, Pastor, my heart has been hardened towards the things of God. I don't hear them like I used to. I don't go to church like I used to. I don't follow God like I used to. Today, I rededicate my life. I'm going to make a new step, a fresh step today, uh, right now, this Sunday morning. And so if that's one of you, maybe you're in here or you're watching online. If you're one of those two people, you need to give your life to Jesus or rededicate your life. I want you to give your, lift your hands up on the count of three so I can see it and I can pray with you. One, two, three, and just lift them up right now. Amen. I see that hand on the left side in the back. I see the center. Thank you. On the right, I see those hands. Thank you. Thank you. I see, I see all those, see those hands. Amen. I see that one. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to pray for those who lifted their hands. Or maybe you said yes to Jesus in your heart or you were online. God sees your hand. Everybody in here say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Change my life. I recognize now that I'm a sinner and I need you. Help me, Lord, to live for you, to honor you, and to give you my all. It's from this day forward, I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody shout amen. amen. Man, give God a hand clap of praise in this place. Come on, church. Well, listen, we're almost done. If you said yes to Jesus for the very first time, please text the word Jesus to that number. Make sure she goes to one of our pastors on staff. We want to make sure you know what your next step is. Okay, listen, lock in with me real quick. I know you're checked out, but just real quick, hang on. Just listen. The best next step for you is actually today because we actually have next steps class right after this service. We don't normally do it. We actually do it once a month. It's today. So it's on the first week of the month. And so if you want to get involved and stop going to church and start being the church, come on, somebody. If you want to come and start being a part of a family instead of just looking on the outside, being on the outside looking in, it's time for you to come.